we've kind of gotten used to BlackRock beating the numbers, beating expectations. That's certainly the case this time around. Uh, also, your assets under management, up by a pretty significant amount, too. We're talking about almost another $100 billion in assets under management up. So where does that put you all right now? Are, are you closing in on $10 trillion? No, Becky. I mean, obviously, we had declines in the equity markets, so, uh, and we also had um, um, a rising dollars. So our assets were basically flattish uh, for the for the quarter. You know, we're approximately about nine and a half trillion. Um, we did see ninety eight billion dollars of net inflows in long term assets from our clients, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, and over the last rolling twelve months, we saw four hundred and fifty billion dollars in net flows. In addition to the quarter, we've just had continuous quarter increases of above a 5% organic growth. And coming in in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, in our third quarter, we had a 9% organic base fee growth. So way beyond what we were committed to the street. And then we also had a 16% increase in revenues. And that's despite in the third quarter where we had fee wave concessions of $130 million in our money market business. And so, you know, this is the third consecutive month this year where we have had over $100 million type of fee concessions. And so even with that, we had a 16% uh, revenue increase um, in, in, our, in our platform. And the, probably the most important thing to say, it was broad base, uh, uh, broad base in ETFs. We actually had $45 billion in active flows uh, uh, flows internationally, flows domestically, in almost every asset category. So a pretty outstanding quarter, uh, and, and in almost every one of our bil uh, businesses showed that resiliency. Part of that revenue growth came from the 13 percent growth you saw in tech services revenue. What, what's happening? Yes. There? Well, I think uh, the Aladdin system is becoming a, uh, a platform for more and more. Uh, of, of the asset managers, insurance companies, endowments and foundations and pension funds are using as a platform um, uh, to uh, manage their entire portfolio, to process their trades, to be working with their custodial banks. We've a actually added quite a new parts of the business to Aladdin, working with financial advisors in, in Aladdin Wealth, helping them understand the associated risks across all their clients' portfolios. Uh, and we hope to be rolling out in the coming quarter Aladdin Climate, where we're going to have uh, analytics to help people understand and judge and measure a portfolio. Right now, it's pretty easy to, to overlay a model related to climate risk and, and see what that will do related to physical impact. What's going to be more difficult and is going to take time is making sure that we have the analytics specifically for every company. And that's going to be a function of how the companies reporting more uh, and it, for companies to be more transparent. And then we could see and judge how companies are performing towards that long term objective of, of a net zero world. Hey, hey, Larry, your results show that people are, are definitely investing more. There, there's interest in that. If you look at J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, they have talked about how card spending is up really significantly, too. You kind of put those pictures together, and that gives you a picture of a, of a very strong consumer and a strong economy right now. But you, you do have some concerns about what you see um, that are significantly more concerning than the views we've gotten from um, either Jamie Dimon or from uh, Brian Moynihan recently. What, what is it that you see that concerns you? Well, I think we're in a long transition, the transition out from COVID. And during the period of COVID, we've seen, as you said, great successes in some components of the economy. And then we see other components of society being left behind. Um, we are seeing a much more fragmented, divergent world in terms of the developing world growing much faster than the developing world. And so we are also in this transition. I mean, part of the irony today, we have more job openings than ever before, and we have uh, it is estimated another 8 million people who were in the workforce were not in the workforce. And so there's this huge uh, divergence between the people who are out of work or looking for a job or maybe and those companies who are looking for um, for help. I believe those who are looking for help is much more overwhelming. But I think uh, I think what is transforming our world and this is that transition that I'm talking about. 
I think we, we underestimate the power of the gig economy. I think we underestimate what COVID has done to so many uh, people around the world in terms of trying to navigate the work uh, family balance. And the gig economy in many cases is a lot more accommodative. I also believe so many companies who are dependent on part-time workers, not paying them um, a health care benefits or retirement benefits, there are alternatives to those jobs now.